American Indians and Native Alaskans make up more than 2% of the U.S. population, a diverse group of 574 federally recognized tribes. This group is disproportionately affected by poverty and health disparities, including mental health conditions. Giving indigenous youth more opportunities is one way of fighting back. I talked to Nikki Santos, the executive director at the Aspen Institute Center for Native American Youth. I met Nikki at her office in Washington, D.C. Nikki is a member of the Coeur d'Alene tribe. She previously worked at the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. Her work now with the Center for Native American Youth is all about empowering young people to take leadership roles and share their stories with a wider audience. The work includes speaking directly with elected officials in the nation's capital. What were some of the messages that uh, they were able to convey while they were here in Washington? Bringing young people to D.C. to talk about mental health, to talk about what they're seeing in their community, what they've dealt with their own personal lived experience, but then also bring solutions. So uh, we talk about priorities for young people, but then we also allow young people to create policy recommendations. And so they came prepared to talk about what they would like to see in the administration, what they would like to see their members of Congress do, and what they've seen works well within their own communities. Um, and so some of that being more culturally competent mental health service providers, some of it being providing education, opportunities to bring elders into the classroom in, uh, in their high schools or elementary schools, or having traditional and cultural language serve as a foreign language requirement to get them into college. There are so many things that our young people are advocating for, and it's, that's why it's so important to also have officials and leaders who look like us who can continue to advocate and be that voice after they leave DC. The center offers programming to Native young people around mental health, including teen suicide prevention. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for Native American youth ages 10 to 24. The current suicide rates among Native youth are three and a half times higher than the national average. So mental health is such a broad term and it's an umbrella. Uh, what are some of the things you're hearing from these young people? So Native youth are telling us about the impacts that suicide has had on their communities. They're talking about the lack of health um, resources that are available to them, culturally competent therapists. They're talking about access to culture because we know that culture is the biggest protective factor. The ability to use traditional plants and medicines, the ability to connect with land, we know has a profound impact on our mental health. Even today, um, when I'm getting stressed out, I always just go outside, breathe in that fresh air. Um, but young people understand, Native youth understand intricately the cultural connection that we have to land and the power of place and how that connects us to our ancestors and the ones that walked before us. And so when young people talk to us about mental health, they talk about the need to have better health care systems, doctors that are informed on traditional plants and medicines. They know the solutions to combat suicide that they're seeing with their peers in their community and ideation that they may even feel in themselves. They also talk about the implications of erasure, race-based mascots, and more, and the profound impact that has on mental health, how that can increase anxiety, perception of value in community, and more. And so we know that when young people are able to identify not just the barriers and challenges, but also come to the table with solutions, we know that we're going to be able to move the needle in to hopefully decrease some of the disparaging data that's against Native youth. Even at the Center for Native American Youth, we're providing youth the opportunities to speak on issues that they care about. We're allowing them to engage civically, address violence against Native women. We're allowing them to do advocacy that protects land and combats climate change. That's prevention. And doing so from an empowerment model, we know that's gonna drive solutions that's gonna be addressing the mental health disparities and suicide statistics that we have. From 1819 to 1969, Native children were forcibly removed from their families and brought to government-run boarding schools. This was done in the name of cultural assimilation, stripping the children of their indigenous language and identity. Many students were subjected to emotional, sexual, and physical abuse, sometimes leading to death. The federal government ran more than 400 of these schools in most U.S. states, in at least 50 schools, investigators found burial sites. You talked about healing. Uh, you also talked about resilience. And let me talk about a couple other R words. Uh, remembrance and reckoning. And 
And reckoning is important because that prevents it from happening again. Remembrance and reckoning still really hasn't happened here in the United States. And it's important, both are important. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And that's something I speak on quite frequently is that when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, when we're talking about healing and transformation, we do have a collective truth that needs to be reckoned with. And I think as a society, we need to really wrap our minds around the true history. As you had talked about the Trail of Tears, there are countless other atrocities that have happened with indigenous people that our nation needs to reckon with if we truly want to transform and heal and move together in a good way. And when I think about that, and I think about the power and the fight that our ancestors had, and knowing that their blood is within me to persevere, and it's in, within my daughter and the young people that we serve, I know the future is going to be bright. We can talk about, we can talk about erasure. We can talk about, you know, the the lack of reckoning. But I'd love to talk to you about the amazing things that young people are doing to create that change that they want to see. So talk to me about the importance of your role. And how did you navigate and find this job? I'm so proud to be at the Aspen Institute and be able to carry my full self and my full identity as an indigenous woman and as a mother. I came to Aspen not too long after I had my daughter because everything changes when you become a parent, you know this. And having a space where I can create programming and opportunity for something that my daughter might want to be part of one day is so rewarding. I couldn't imagine being anywhere else. She also serves as a UN Goodwill Ambassador with a focus on improving mountain environments and the lives of the people living there. You are also a UN Goodwill Ambassador. You were named that. Um, how exciting was that? What does that entail? And, and how has that experience shaped you? Yes, thank you. I am incredibly excited. So this fall, I traveled to Aspen. The United Nations was convening the Mountain Partnership Meeting and I was able to give remarks, provide an acceptance, and I will be traveling to Rome for International Mountain Day and speaking at the Vatican. Um, the theme is going to be women who move mountains, and I'm incredibly excited. Growing up in the Pacific Northwest, the most beautiful mountainous terrain, and so being able to talk about the importance of indigenous knowledge, combating climate change, and supporting and advocating for environmental justice, because of the upbringing that I had within a mountainous terrain is something I'm proud to bring with me. I'm also very excited to be able to talk about indigenous solutions and indigenous ways of knowing when we're talking about a better world, a more resilient world, when we're talking about um, addressing sea level rise, uh, climate change and more. And so I'm incredibly honored I'm a little bit intimidated, but I, I know that I have my grandmothers and my ancestors going through me and I plan to be a vessel for them in the work ahead. It's so funny you bring that up because I, I kind of feel like, and I've talked to other people about this, we wouldn't have climate change if we just leaned on Native Americans because they have such a love and appreciation of the land and we abuse it. Um, can you talk about that? Yes, you know, even recently at the United Nations event, I saw on a panel where I had talked about the importance in indigenous knowledge systems. Um, you know, whether it is whether it is navigating the cosmos, knowing how to cultivate land, traditional plants and medicines that can heal people. And seeing that science is trying to navigate this, it's it can be difficult at times. But I think that the folks that are in the climate movement are starting to understand and reckon with the truth that indigenous solutions need to play a large role. And so I'm really honored to be able to support the movement. So what kind of solutions will you provide when you get up there and you're moving mountains, you're also speaking. What, what, <laughs> uh, what, what might you tell these folks in the audience? Yes, you know, the most important thing that I was raised with was being in relation with the land. So when we're looking at hiking a mountain, the mountain is our grandfather. And how would you treat your grandfather? Would you disrespect it? Would you take things from your grandfather that don't belong to you? You know, just to, to, to bring back home to show off? Absolutely not. 
So the most important thing is to being in relation. And when we stop looking at land as ownership or something to conquer or dominate, and we start looking at it as a relative, I think that's when the transformation is gonna happen. In 2020, Nikki wrote an article arguing that the US media often overlooks native votes in their election projections. But these voters have been key in elections, especially in swing states and states with large native populations. You've written political science data has for too long erased Native American people, generally marking us as other, which I think we've kind of sort of talking about that, or as an asterisk, simply because our population is seen as too small to make an impact. They had an impact. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it was so exciting. So we have had, for the past two elections, historical record of indigenous people turning out to the polls. Our young people know that voting is a way and a pathway forward. We're seeing at the national level, local levels, um, community levels, indigenous people running for offices that we had only imagined um, would be available to them. You know, just uh, the other day, Congresswoman Mary Peltola was uh, confirmed as a, as a congresswoman from Alaska, a native woman. Um, you know, and even at the local levels, seeing in the city of Seattle, Deborah Juarez, a member of the Blackfeet Nation, uh, serving on city council. It's, it's incredibly exciting. Even the candidates uh, who are running for office, a historical turnout. And so it's so important, as we talked about earlier, the power and positive representation. There are so many organizations that work to support candidates, to support people going out to the polls. And the Center for Native American Youth, we have a program called Democracies Indigenous, where we mobilize young people, not just necessarily to get them to the polls, but to understand their important role in civics. Civic engagement happens year round, whether it's mobilizing your community to get a mural that talks about you know, um, an issue that they care about, or getting folks to the polls, getting people to vote. Civic engagement is so important, and so we're really proud to work alongside Native American youth to ensure that they are also empowered and engaged civically. I remember, this was years back, uh, reading a story, and it was one of these small little boxes, you know, in the newspaper, but it was, I think it was in the state of Kansas, uh, where they had moved a polling site away, to, away from a Native American area, about 40 minutes away, so now the people would have to get on a bus to get there, and they'd have to, like, maybe they work till five, they didn't have to get on the bus, and then, you know, it was such a hassle to go and vote. And, it, and that story didn't get very much traction at all. I want to ask you about these impediments. Mm. Are they still out there? What are some of the things that you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. So inaccessibility to polls, lack of good transportation to get them to the polls. Even folks who speak their native language, let's say on the Navajo Nation, um, the inaccessibility to having, having ballots that are in the Navajo language. Um, the on Indian reservations, oftentimes there are not paved roads or road signs. So the home address might be a post office box and that is not valid. Um, or having a tribal identification card rather than a driver's license and sometimes polling locations don't recognize that. It's really important that we recognize these barriers, but I'm also incredibly inspired because it's Native American youth who are saying, okay, well, I'm gonna rent a car then and I'm gonna host a, a community dinner where we invite candidates to the community. So then, you know, young people and community members can get to know the candidates. It's young people who are really mobilizing, knocking on doors of elders saying, hey, auntie, you might not understand this. Let me translate it for you. Let me talk about the importance of this. And so I'm just so incredibly inspired and proud of young people who are leading in solutions to address the barriers. But we as a society need to do better to ensure that we are being equal in providing the um, equal access to opportunity to be able to vote for all Native people. And what does that say about uh, this society, which, you know, I guess in our entire history, it's, it's been this effort to erase a population and all the stuff you talked about, you know, the fact that you, you know, you have a P.O. box and you don't have an address. And it, I mean, that's basically let's erase this population again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, since the onset of European colonization, it has it in the impacts of genocide, whether it's forcible removal um, of land uh, forced into places um, where essentially colonizers didn't think that we would survive harsh winters. Um, forcible, forcing our children to go into boarding schools, federal Indian boarding schools, 
um, punishing us for speaking the only language that we knew, cutting our hair, trying to, and, and then even now we're seeing it play out in, in what we had just talked about. Our people are so resilient. Um, and so I think that it's, we're still seeing that our society has an incredible long way to go, but we're starting to make steps in, in addressing. And I'm so proud because we run a program in California, for example, um, the California Native Youth Collective, and they're working with the governor's office on a Truth and Healing Reconciliation Act that kind of addresses and acknowledges the trauma that our people have faced since the onset of colonization and works to course correct it by providing opportunity um, for young people to be able to, to help support solutions and healing most importantly. Um, for myself, my own tribal community, are, our land is so beautiful, but I remember my auntie telling us that they moved us onto this reservation simply because they didn't think that we survived the harsh winters. But they didn't know that we've navigated these mountains since time of memorials. And um, I'll also share that 50% of Native people live in urban areas. We're out here in DC, in New York City, in Los Angeles. And so we're able to also be navigating, you know, urban spaces, uh, addressing system, systematic inequities in some of our nation's largest cities. And it's really important, um, especially that we're targeting and working with young people um, to provide them the resources that they need, even if they're not in an isolated uh, reservation. So freely, without any mental reservation, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. In 2021, Deb Holland made history by becoming the first Native American to serve in the U.S. Cabinet when she was sworn in as the Secretary of the Interior. On the office upon which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, my brother. <laughs> and as of 2022, there are six Native members serving in the House of Representatives. Can you talk about what kind of impact that has and kind of the changing dynamics of what we're seeing in, in the U.S.? This is such an exciting time. We are seeing people who look like us, who are leading our health facilities, who are leading institutions, who are running nonprofits that benefit Native American youth. We're seeing the most powerful Native American woman serve as the United States Secretary of the Department of Interior. Um, members of Congress um, are, are a historic rate that look just like us. You know, this is such an exciting time to bring Native American youth, especially to Washington, D.C. It's difficult to put into words because it's so empowering. And to have members of Congress who are making important decisions that impact our elders, our young people, our community, our land, it's so incredibly powerful. And I know that we, our future is bright because of, because of the leaders that we have at the table. It's interesting. I, I remember having a conversation years ago with somebody who talked about the importance of dreams. But they said having the capacity to dream is even more important. And sometimes it's difficult to have the capacity to dream if there isn't somebody at that position. Um, growing up and not seeing people like her as Secretary of the Interior, not seeing people in those positions, what was that like for you? And how do you think that's going to help shape Native American youth versus what you dealt with growing up? Yeah. You know, it was difficult to find positive representation, and so I always saw it within my own family. You know, my mother is a former principal of an elementary school, so I got to see, when I couldn't see teachers reflective of my culture or somebody who looked like me, I looked at my mom. Um, my auntie was the first Native American to run for United States Congress, Jean Givens. And so we have a very strong um, matriarchs in our community. My late grandmother was um, a United States, in the United States Marine Corps, and she was tough. And so I looked within my own community and my own family to see that representation. Now we get to look at national levels and to have young people be able, anywhere they go, they're able to see the, these amazing leaders. I think that our future is incredibly bright. And there are times when I didn't see the representation growing up and having the determination to say, okay, I'm going to be that for somebody else. Um, and now Secretary Holland has told us multiple times that she is going to leave a ladder down for the next generation to ensure that she may be the first, but she won't be the last. So you spend a lot of time with young people. Uh, how are they different from when you were young? And how do you suspect they'll be different from your five-year-old daughter? <laughs> so 
I think what's incredibly important and the power that we have at the Center for American Youth and the power that is the Aspen Institute is that we provide spaces for people to tell their truth. It is incredibly intentional. It is important that young people know that who they are and what they have to say matters. I'm not sure there are that many spaces that I can remember where I was told that. And so it's very important for, for our young people to know that we, we provide them these resources and opportunities, but we also provide holistic supports. You know, whether it's um, we're taking them to a ceremony before we do a intervention or leadership program, or making sure that they have access to medicines, intergenerational spaces, um, and auntie or grandma that they can rely on after we leave. It's very important, and I'm not sure if I had those opportunities when I was young. It's also making me be a more conscious parent and mother and making sure that I'm continually providing these wraparound supports um, you know, to ensure that she's also reminded that who she is and what she has to say matters, even if she's only five years old. <laughs> I think she has a bright future with a mom like you. Thank you so Thank much, you. Nikki. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. The pleasure's mine.